Hi, I'm Dan, and in this video we're going to be going through the May 2023 release for Bookstack. Now before getting into the details, there are quite a few upgrade notices for this release. Specifically, if you've done anything to customize the markdown editor or code blocks within Bookstack, then a lot of the customization methods that we provided around those areas have now changed quite significantly. So please review the update notes for further information. Also, if you use SAML2 as your login system and you use single logout, then Bookstack now passes through a session index to the logout request, which actually brings us closer to the spec. And I don't foresee this causing any issues but it might be wise just to test the logout process on your system to make sure it doesn't change anything. And lastly, the behavior of page include tags has changed, meaning you could possibly see a little bit more content now, but we'll get onto that a little bit later on in the video. But to kick off the features of this release, we're first gonna start within the terminal, because a new thing that I wanna show is the Bookstack system command line interface. Now this is a new command line interface to help with admin operations and it's included within Bookstack itself. So within my installation folder, I can now find a Bookstack system CLI. And if I run this with no arguments, it's gonna tell me what it can do. So if I press enter now, and as it displays out here, it's got several commands built in. We can back up a Bookstack instance using the backup command. We can initialize a new Bookstack install. We can restore a backup that was created from the backup command. And we can also use this to update a Bookstack instance. So as an example, let's use this command line and we'll call the backup command. You can see it goes through the process and it's already done it. And it provides us an output zip file. So this zip file will contain by default, a dump of the Bookstack database, any uploaded files like attachments or images that you've provided to the Bookstack when at least using the local storage options, which are the default ones. And it will also contain the ENV file for your instance. So you have a backup of the config. It will also back up your themes folder. So if you've defined any themes, they'll be within the zip. And lastly, it'll store a copy of the command line interface itself. So if you need to restore it later, you already have a copy of the command line to do the restore operation if needed. And we can see here it's been stored within our Bookstack installation folder, which is this part, slash storage, slash backups, and then the Bookstack backup, and then a date timestamp for today. And this storage backups location is a new one that we've added, and that's going to be the default place where your backups are stored when you run this command. But of course, you can customize the locations of where these kind of things are stored. For example, we'd call the backup command and then pass in a second parameter to say, hey, store this within my home directory, slash Bookstack backup.zip and now it will use that path instead. So as another example, let's restore in that backup that we just created. So we'll go restore and then we'll pass in a reference to the zip file that we wanna restore from. So we'll go storage backups and that zip file. And then it will list out exactly what it's gonna restore with some warnings and we'll go, yeah, that looks good. Let's go through the process. It's gonna restore those files. It's gonna delete everything out of the current database and restore our backup into that. And there we go, it's restored everything into here. This initial release, I would consider as a very much early alpha phase of the command line. You're highly likely to come across bugs. I have tested on a whole range of Unix based systems and the tool itself is written in PHP, so it should be system abstract. But something like this is so system dependent that new things can crop up all the time. But otherwise this is included within the new 23.05 release. So you can give it a go. Just be cautious about using it. Maybe use it after taking a backup via your normal methods. But now it's out there. Hopefully we can get some good feedback and have this mature over time. And eventually this will become the more kind of recommended approach just because it provides a nice, easy way to do a lot of these operations. Right, next up, we got a revised file upload experience. And this specifically relates to two key areas. One is the image manager, which we're seeing here. And the other is attachments, which we'll come on to in a second. So here, looking at the image manager, you can see things have changed a little bit. There's no longer a little upload box here. Instead, we have an upload image button, which we can select to then choose an image. Or alternatively, as this text suggests here, I can drag in a file, and instead of it just being a singular little box in the corner, you can now pretty much drop into anywhere within this window. So I'll just drop there, and then the upload would start. But as you can see here, this one has an error on it. So the little upload progress boxes, such as this one, now display a little bit differently, a bit more Bookstack styled. And I wanted to show an error scenario here because now we provide a bit more information obvious up front. Before you had to kind of hover and then it wasn't easy to see the whole text of the error. Now it's a little bit easy. I can hover over this and then kind of scroll down and see the full text of what's gone on and what's errored in this case. If I do that again, just to show a successful scenario, 
we can see it works nicely like that. Also, since I've been working on the image manager, I've just tidied up a few of the styles a little bit. There was a few double borders. There was some use of background colors that didn't work so well with the icons. They're all little tweaks, but it just neatens things up and makes things a bit more presentable. All right, jumping over to attachments, these have had a bit more of a substantial change. If we go to Attachments Manager, you can see there's no longer a tabbed base interface. Whereas before you'd have tabs for attachments list, upload file and attached link. Now you simply see the list right away and now you've got kind of the upload interface built into the top here with a button to also go to the attached link form as well. So just everything's a bit more streamlined and simplified so you don't have to do as many clicks to do what you need. And again, that new upload experience has kind of been built into this. If I drag and drop a file, then it works just like that. Now on to code blocks. So all code blocks within the system, and this includes like ones in the settings area and the one used for the markdown editor. We use a library called Code Mirror to render these areas and to do the syntax highlighting and things like that. And a lot of work since August of last year has gone into upgrading from an older version of Code Mirror, Code Mirror 5, to the newest version, Code Mirror 6. And this was quite a fundamental revision and a massive change in terms of the code base. But hopefully very little should be different from a user point of view, apart from maybe some slight theme and syntax styling changes but it should provide us some better mobile support which may be especially helpful in the markdown editor in addition just making sure that we're not using outdated libraries and on the subject of code we have a look at this code block here this is a new language option that we have so we now have syntax support for closure code in regards to the API, we have another new couple sets of endpoints in this release. So the first of which is the image gallery API endpoints, which we can see here. You have all your typical actions like list, create, read, and update. If we go to the list endpoint, for example, we get a full list of the images that are used in page content. And this covers both standard page content images and also drawings. So this brings kind of granular image control via the API, which wasn't previously possible outside of doing some awkward base64 encoding within content. Additionally, we have the content permissions API, and this allows you to set permissions on pages, books, chapters, and shelves. Basically, anything that you'd usually be able to do within this kind of view, you can now do that via the API, which should be quite handy to some because previously it wasn't possible to upload something new and then set permissions directly on that via the API. Now an update to page include tags. So page include tags allow you to dynamically include content from other pages. For example, if we're looking at this page here, we've got page C with this bit of text, policy in page C. If we go to page B and edit that, you can see that's got this include tag that's dynamically bringing in that page C content into page B, as well as having its own text. So that wasn't part of what we saw in the editor, so it's been dynamically brought in. So this has been a feature for a while, and this system has always worked to a single layer of including. So that, for example, if page C had it as include as well, that wouldn't be passed out. And this was just to make sure that everything stays performant and that you don't get caught in any kind of recursive loops where you're including something that's including itself. But within this release, we're upping that limit to three layers. So if we go to page A here, and if we have a look at this, this is including the content within page B, and then page B, as we saw earlier, is including content from page C. So we've got multiple levels here. And of course, you can do some funky stuff. Like, for example, here we've got this nested include tag. And this tag here is including the current page. So it's including itself. So if we save this and have a look what it looks like, as you can see, this kind of like triples its content out because it's being included up to that three level limit. So I doubt this will ever be used for this specific purpose, but it kind of shows how the system is working. Now, building onto the logical theme system, we have a new logical theme event, which is the OIDC ID token pre-validate. So it's quite a technical event, this one, but this allows you to customize the user ID token data coming into Bookstack from your OpenID Connect authentication system. And right here, I've got quite an arbitrary example of prepending sir to any names ending with chuckle that come in from the data from your authentication system. But a more realistic use case might be to adapt non-standard data coming from your identity provider or to morph data coming in to fit the structure that Bookstack expects. And in regards to the more developer side of things, because I've been spending a lot of time on the JavaScript code within this release, I've done some cleanup there. So now we're using ESLint to standardize the formatting and coding style across the whole JavaScript code base within Bookstack. And also we used to have these things that we called editor events to customize configuration and the actions of libraries used on the JavaScript side of Bookstack. These are now more generically named JavaScript public events. And these are now fully documented within the project repo. So within dev docs, JavaScript public events, there's a document detailing each event within the system, how they're formatted, 
the parameters that are passed in, and there's examples for each of those events. In this release, we add a new SMTP email option, which we can see here in a new section of the documentation. But basically, this allows you to disable SSL or TLS verification, which does make you open to man in the middle attacks. But whether that's an issue or an acceptable risk really depends on your environment. But the option's there for those that know that they need it. And of course, our translations have been updated again by this remarkable roster of people. So thank you to everyone within this list that has helped contribute translations to Bookstack. Now for the next steps, within the last release, I did say about opening up some discussions in terms of some of the larger features. And during the last release cycle, I've been thinking about how we best support like multilingual content. And really the way that I kind of primarily envisioned supporting that kind of thing would require a lot of fundamental change and complexity added to Bookstack. And if we ever go down that road, I want to be confident that it is the right approach because it's going to add a lot of maintenance debt and it's quite likely to slow things down for development in general of many other things. So before going further, I'd really like to explore exactly what the pain points are currently within Bookstack and what people are lacking in regards to supporting multilingual content. So I've created this post within this issue thread that basically asks a core question to try and get more information from users that need this ability. So I'll put a link to this in the description. If you have an interest in multilingual content, please have a look at my comment there and provide a response. Otherwise, since I've been doing some work around the image manager within Bookstack, I've noticed that that image manager interface is still a little bit old. At least it is not very mobile friendly and I'm not sure it's accessible either to things like screen readers. So I want to do a bit of an overhaul just to make sure we can bring that up to the standards that we'd expect. Otherwise, I'd like to start diving into comments and notifications because these are big things that people are asking for quite a lot. I mean, notifications is quite a big complex feature, not so much on the core implementation, but as soon as you start thinking about the business rules that people may want in terms of how notifications are organized and the level of user controls that are provided around them. So I'm probably not going to dive too far in this release cycle, but what I'll probably do is have a look at some of the smaller features improvements and additions that we can make around comments and just getting back into that area of the application which i haven't touched in quite a while should just allow me to get familiar and then during that process i can have some ideas and then potentially bring things to the community in terms of any questions that might need to be answered to take things up to the next level and lastly i just want to mention our project update post that we put out for march so because there was no release around that time i made this post instead just highlighting a lot of the supporting work that's gone on in bookstack so this features some of the new hacks some of the new scripts that we've added as well as some of the more meta elements that I've done around the project. So yeah, that's the May release for Bookstack. I hope you enjoy the new features and I would very much welcome feedback, especially in terms of the new system command line interface. Otherwise, I wish you a smooth upgrade process and I hope you have a wonderful day.